That's the schedule, so everybody knows. The hotline number is 713-274-3880, and that's for both permitting and debris questions. We're approximately on first pass, 50% complete. And like I said, first pass is the largest amount of debris. And Russ Poppy, Executive Director of Harris County Flood Control, and uh, probably we'll get Jeff Lindner, the meteorologist, involved in this somewhere in his famous blue shirt to talk about rainfalls and things like that. So, Russ? Thank you, Judge. So, we uh, do debris removal within our infrastructure as well. Uh, we've had around 2,500 miles of channels within Harris County. And as one might imagine, with the rainfall that we experienced during Hurricane Harvey, uh, we got a lot of debris washed into our channels. And so as soon as it's safe to do so, we had our internal crews already going out and addressing the debris that was easily accessible as well as safe to get to from, uh, from a construction removal process. Uh, we also know, given the large scale of our number of channels, again, I mentioned 2,500 miles, we're also using a, a staged contract that we already had in place prior to Hurricane Harvey even making landfall. So we've, as of September 4th, we've initiated that contract as well. So between in-house resources as well as contract labor, we're actively pursuing the removal of the debris from within our channels. And it's really critical because removing that debris helps us reestablish the overall carrying capacity of our channels. And again, it goes without saying, it's difficult to remove the debris because it's dependent upon the weather. So in other words, if we get some rain and the flood levels or the water levels come up in their bayous, the crews can't work. So again, right now our best estimate is around three to four months from now to getting all the debris removed from within our channels. And this is an ongoing uh, process as of now. So the next topic that we have a lot of calls coming into our office is buyouts. Um, we've been doing buyouts in large part with FEMA for the last 20 years in Harris County. And in 20 years we've acquired around 3,000 parcels underneath our voluntary buyout program. However, since Hurricane Harvey hit our area, we've received over 3,000 inquiries from residents advising us of their desire to be purchased underneath our buyout program. Uh, there is criteria that has to be considered, and that criteria is on our website, hcfcd.org, and you can go and, and figure out if you meet that criteria. And depending upon which FEMA program gets funded is gonna dictate the, the criteria that's gonna be used to set the priority for those acquisitions. Uh, but I will say in general, homes that have a flood insurance policy that are located within a 100-year floodplain, and if they've experienced flood damages in the past, usually score fairly well within that program. But unfortunately, we need federal funding in order to start making these buyouts. And so we've been advocating uh, very strongly with FEMA and our federal partners to try to make <laughs> immediate funding available for these buyouts so that we can conduct these buyouts and, and get these residents relocated before significant reinvestment is made back in these homes that ultimately would get bought out underneath the program. Uh, the other thing that we've been asked about is how many projects do we have in queue that we can accelerate to provide additional flood relief to our area. And the four that immediately come to my mind are the ones that we are actively constructing now with the, our partner, the Corps of Engineers. Uh, we have four active federal projects within Harris County. That's Clear Creek, Braze Bayou, White Oak Bayou, and Hunting Bayou. All those are active core projects, meaning not only are they shovel ready, but they're construction ready because we've made progress constructing components of these federal projects. But the problem is, uh, or the challenge is, in order for us to get those done in a relatively short amount of time, we need funding. And so we're advocating for uh, federal funding up front that would allow us to accelerate the completion of these projects, which upon completion will bring additional uh, flood relief to thousands of our residents within the city and the county. Hi there, everybody. I'm going to give a little bit of an overview. I know there's been a lot of talk since Harvey uh, of how big this event was. And so I'm going to try to classify some of that today and give a little bit of an overview of what the Flood Control District has been doing with respect to data collection. Obviously, this is an event that we want to make sure we document very well. The data that's collected is something that we'll be using for a long time. So roughly over the four-day period from Harvey, the county averaged 33 and a half inches of rain. That's roughly 69% of what we see on an annual basis in Harris County. 
So we got roughly 69% of our total yearly rainfall in four days. Um, the most astounding factor or fact that comes from Harvey is when you look at all of the rainfall events across the United States on the scale of a five-day period and over 10,000 square miles. Harvey exceeds every single rainfall event in the United States, and it exceeds the closest event, which happened in the state of Louisiana in 1940, by 62 percent. That's the closest record to Hurricane Harvey. So it was exceeded, Harvey exceeded the previous record by 62 percent from the state of Louisiana in 1940. Uh, looking at the counting, the, both the two-day and the four-day rainfall totals average anywhere from a 2,000 to plus or well over a 5,000-year event across the entire county. And the 47 inches of rain, almost 47 and a half inches of rain that fell on Clear Creek in the four-day period equates to roughly about a 25 to 50,000-year event. So this was a very large event. And I want to make sure in the historical context we understand how big of an event this was. As far as our data and documentation, we have collected the Harris County Flood Control District has collected 588 high water marks. And what that is, is we go out, we find how high the water got. Usually water leaves behind a debris line, seed line, a mud line. We go out, we survey that to determine how high the water got above mean sea level. Uh, 451 of those marks were taken along our channels our bayous, our creeks, the channels that drain into our bayous and creeks. And of those 451, 228, or 51%, were new records. It's the highest the water level has ever gotten at those locations. The previous greatest high water marking effort we ever attempted was after Hurricane Ike in 2008, when we collected 496 marks. And again, we exceeded that this time by collecting 500 and 88. We have 22 watersheds in Harris County. Of, of the 22, 13 recorded new record high water levels. The other thing I'd like to mention, a lot of you are aware of our flood warning system. That's our network of gauges that monitor the rainfall and the stage elevations in our channels. We had seven of those gauges that were damaged and destroyed by the flooding. All seven of those have been returned uh, to operation. So all of our real-time flood warning monitoring equipment is back in operation in the county. It is functional, and we encourage people to use that. And the last thing, because there has been a lot of questions about, does this, does Harvey result in any type of, of new rainfall statistics or new mapping? And before Harvey occurred, the flood control district, along with the Corps of Engineers and NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, we're working on something called NOAA Atlas 14. And what that is, is this is an update for this entire state of Texas for these rainfall frequencies we talk about so often, the 100-year rainfall, the 500-year rainfall. And so that effort was underway. It was almost complete when Hurricane Harvey happened. Uh, and what we have asked NOAA and the Corps to do is to make sure Harvey gets incorporated into that study. And so they have agreed that Harvey is going to be incorporated into that study. The results of this effort um, should be out in the spring of 2018. That may need to be revised a little bit since Harvey's going to be included in this. But that will give us some idea. This will incorporate everything in Harris County that has happened from post-tropical storm Allison to currently right now. So that includes the droughts we've had in 2011. It also includes all the floods we've had in the recent past three years. And so putting all that together, it will give us a new baseline of what is our 100-year, 500-year return frequencies uh, for this area. And based on those findings, we have no idea what they're going to be, but based on those findings, there will be some investigations as to uh, is there the potential or is there the need of reinvestigating or looking at the floodplains. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. And finally, uh, NRG uh, shelter is, is closed. Uh, everybody who was there uh, on the last day has been transferred to Greenspoint Mall. 
to uh, an American Red Cross shelter. So now most of our attention is uh, on what we call disaster recovery centers. There are 15 set up across Harris County by FEMA. That's where you go to get all the information about FEMA and Small Business Administration. In addition, three of those sites uh, have what we call DSNAP programs, the Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program for people who, who need uh, to join the SNAP program at least temporarily. Those sites are at Greensport Mall, the Pasadena Convention Center, and at the Southwest uh, Community Center, Southwest Multi-Service Center on High Star. Uh, seem to be functioning well. Uh, massive numbers of people need assistance, but FEMA's on site, SBA's on site, uh, and the state of Texas is, is there for the, for the DSNAP program. So that's what we had to report. Uh, be happy to take any questions. Good. Can you talk about, uh, or maybe somebody from engineering, about the buyouts, uh, the emergency buyouts are underway, specifically in the Banana Bend area? I understand you guys had a number of meetings and repeat the question. Uh, the question is uh, about buyouts in the Banana Bend subdivision. That's one of the targeted buyout areas flood control is going to work on. Engineering, because there's no access to Banana Bend, the 1,000 foot of the road was actually destroyed. Uh, it's critical to find out the interest in buyouts. So we've had some meetings to gain interest. We actually had meetings with homeowners to explain the process in anticipation of buyout starting. Uh, because like I said, those people can't even get to their homes right now. It was, is that the first area that you guys are targeting at this point? Uh, the question Post is, yeah, is that the first area? The, the flood control district is going to set the criteria, but we picked that area because people couldn't even get to their houses. And normally we would put data on their houses, identify them. So we actually put signs up and had them come to a meeting and explain about the buyouts. When we get all the information on the buyout from the federal government, flood control will be conducting meetings with everybody. This was the only area that people couldn't get to their houses. Now, are you guys going to rebuild that road? We have, we are going to put, and it's under construction right now, a low water crossing. We don't intend to rebuild the road at this time. It would be millions of dollars to rebuild the road, but we do need a way to get things in and out of the neighborhood, uh, regardless of what happens. So we are building that right now. How long does a buyout take? I know people would like it to be overnight, but that's not reality. I'm going to let the flood control district handle the buyouts. So the question was, how long does it typically take to do a buyout? And historically, the way these grants have worked, they usually come and the money is available after the event itself happens. And so what you'll see is six months or so after the event, money is made available for not only the district, but people statewide to apply for these grants. The money typically comes from FEMA, FEMA, is, the money is then allocated or, or referred to the state to help distribute that funding. So the state and FEMA sort of sets the criteria. And again, that's why it's so important for us to find out what buckets can be filled with money from FEMA so we can start figuring out what the criteria is going to be. Uh, but in general, you know, it takes several months to, to solicit the applications from across the state. There's been a screening process to make sure that all the applicants included in, in those uh, grant applications meet the criteria. And once that happens, then the state looks at how much money they have available versus the need and start making allocations based upon that. It's very rare that we as a, as a sporting local sponsor get all the money that we ask for. It's usually some percentage of that. And it just really sort of depends on the event and what money is available at that time. But from the time the grant itself hits the street and people can start applying for it until we can start actually making offers to people to buy them out, it's typically nine months, sometimes as long as a year. And that's why it's so important right now that given the, the experience that we've had with Hurricane Harvey, we're advocating for a much quicker timeline so that we can start doing these buyouts on these qualifying properties well in advance of them making uh, initial investments in these properties that will likely get bought out underneath this program. Thank you. Uh, so I just, can you review so that I'm sure I'm clear? You said 3,000 homes have been approved. Is that the 17 million under that? No, so, let me, so we've had three, over 3,000 residents call in expressing their desire to be considered as part of our buyout program. So it doesn't mean that we've screened all those to see if they meet all the criteria because again, we're waiting to find out what, what program is gonna get funded. But that just sort of kind of gives you an idea of the amount of interest that's currently out there in our buyout program. Uh, absolutely, and so maybe about a week ago or so, we heard that uh, 
you yes. had given 17 million to do. Right, that. so that was a grant application that was made available for folks like us to make an application to be considered for that program. And I think in total, that was a $17 million application. But again, until the state receives all the other applicants oh, okay. across, the, across the state, evaluate that against uh, their criteria that they've established, and then they're gonna figure out how much money is available for the different applicants who apply for that grant. And that's gonna take us several months before we find out what, if any, money will so be So that money is a guarantee? That's correct. Okay. But, but there's like 80 some odd parcels of property that's under your emergency buyout, right? In, in county engineering, I think? You guys have already, like... No, there's no emergency buyout. There's a buyout program run by flood control. There's area where people can't get to their houses, and that's what we looked at. And it was Banana Bend. I don't remember how many parcels. There's a, there's a number of houses in there, as well as vacant lots. There's probably a total of 80 houses in vacant lots. That sounds about right. Uh, and, Judge, are you any further along than any talk about long-term solution in the sense of um, are we going to get the state uh, or the feds to come on board? Or, I mean, is there going to be like a trillion dollar bond package at some point to do the pipe or do, you know, all, all these actual significant projects that might actually do? The question is, has there been any progress on the long term uh, approach to how we don't flood like this again in the future? Uh, at this point, there's lots of conversation. We have to not let that conversation just drift away. Uh, there will be a significant buyout program as part of this because, you know, looking back on it, people were allowed before 1984 when there were no controls, uh, people built places where they shouldn't be. So there are going to be those buyouts. Since then, uh, we've got to redefine, as Jeff said, what is a 100-year flood? What's a 500-year flood? I've, uh, I've said half seriously over the last week or two, you know, we've had three 500-year events in two years. Does that mean our definition of a 500-year event, event is wrong, or does that mean we maybe have 1,500 years free and clear? I don't think anybody thinks the latter's the case, so clearly we've got to go back and look at what our floodplains are and make, uh, make adjustments. But more importantly, we are going to have to look at spending serious amounts of money from the federal, state, and local level, uh, need new reservoirs. We need to complete all these projects that Russ Poppy was talking about. Uh, we've got to do all the buyouts. And then we've got to take a hard look at, at what are our rules and regulations relative to development, and are they good? And that, that's all, all long term. But I, I think that those things will happen uh, because Everybody that I've talked to understands that over the years we do surveys and the surveys say crime's the most important thing for our region or transportation. I don't think there's any question right now that everybody believes that flood control is the most important thing for our region. So it will happen. The legislature doesn't meet again until January of 19 and that should be a very interesting legislative session. Does it make any sense to allow homeowners who don't want to buy out to remain in chronically flood-prone areas. And I guess what I'm saying is, say half the folks want to buy out and the other half don't. Is there, does there come a time when you say, whether you want one or not, we're buying out? And, and Judge, you, you've talked about this in the past. Yeah, I, I can only, personally, I think it does come to that point. And I would reference back to uh, uh, the subsidence issue when the Brownwood subdivision in Baytown was sinking into the bay, uh, it became a, a mandatory buyout. Uh, we have not, I don't believe we've ever done a mandatory buyout. Have we, Russ? We've we done have a few. A few. So yeah, I think we have to do that because uh, it's, uh, it becomes a health and safety issue and it becomes a, a financial issue for the county, the city, the state, and FEMA. So about 3,000 underneath our voluntary program since about 1997. Judge, I have a perception, your favorite topic, perception. Um, Scott Pelley, 60 Minutes, last night did a 15-minute report on, on what's going on here in Houston, leaving the nation with, uh, I believe, 
the suggestion that Harris County Houston knew this was a possibility and didn't want to make the investment necessary for the infrastructure to protect the community from the kind of damage that we just endured. Jeff just told us we didn't have a thousand uh, year event. We had a 25,000 year event in some parts of our area. Um, did we know this could happen and did we cheat out? <coughs> Did we know it could happen? Uh, I didn't. I, I think th this is beyond any expectation that I would ever have had. Did we know flooding could happen? Absolutely. We live on the Gulf Coast. Uh, did we know that certain areas of our region, because these projects haven't been completed, that we could have flooding? Sure. That's why we're doing those projects, to get a lot, of, a lot more people and property out of harm's way. But a, an, an event of this magnitude, no. I, I don't think any of us, I'm looking at Jeff, any of us could have foreseen this type of rainfall over as widespread part of the county as, as we've seen. Is there an institutional acceptance now that the storms are becoming stronger and more frequent moving forward? I don't know about an institutional acceptance. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to hit me in the forehead too many times, so before I go, well, clearly things have changed. Uh, we've had three 500-year floods or above in the last two years. So there is a new normal, and we've all been talking about that. But what it should make us do is go back, and hopefully we're over this issue of – I'm going to wade into politics a little bit here – Hopefully we're over this issue of the state telling local governments, flood control districts, and everything else, we want to hold down your revenue to just the bare minimum because if we did that, then we'll never be able to complete these projects and we wouldn't have this emergency operations center that we have. So now I hope the new normal includes local, state, federal <laughs> governments working together to do the things that we know need to be done and no longer questioning, well, maybe we'll do it 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I don't think that's an acceptable path going it, forward. It sounds like you're pointing to the state for accountability. For those residents who experienced the flood in 2015, a flood in 2016, and now a flood in 2017, are you doing enough for those residents? No. And that's our whole point. Uh, and I'm not pointing to the state for accountability. I'm pointing to the state to say, let Harris County run its flood control program with your assistance. Let us do our emergency operations. Let us decide where it's best to spend our money locally because that's going to be a key piece. But no, nobody could look back and say, have we done enough? In an ideal world, these projects that we're talking about would be much farther along than they are. In an ideal world, the third reservoir would be more than just some lines on a map from decades ago whenever it was first brought up. And in an ideal world, we would have already been looking at things like how do we improve the, uh, the, de the tension rates, not only for new development, but also along some of these watersheds. People in Kingwood, for example, really wish that there had been some kind of detention upstream along the west fork of the San Jacinto River. So we need to start looking at those. We need to move all those up into a priority. But you're saying basically like you hope the legislature doesn't pass SB2 like sort of property rollbacks and you pay for all this? Is that sort of what you're saying? You no, know, the question was, and I'm sorry I hadn't been repeating the question. I just challenged all in to do it on a regular basis. No, I'm just uh, kind of following up on what right. you were saying. Uh, so the question about SB2, no, there was another bill that was introduced that was even worse that would restrain state uh, the local revenue to population growth plus inflation. Well, based on what? Population growth they were using was the state population growth, but Harris County grows a lot faster than the state. Inflation, what is that? I mean, what do we do here in Harris County? We do criminal justice, we do indigent health care, we do flood control and transportation. Those aren't tied to any consumer price index that I know of. And so every county is different. I think this event shows that Harris County is a major urban county where we have 
almost 2 million people living in unincorporated Harris County. We've got to be able to deal with that population and, and locally elected officials, I think, are in a better position to make those determinations. Bear Creek subdivision, um, uh, almost 2,000 homes were affected due to addicts. Are you guys, is the Harris County doing something right now for those people? Don't talk about that? Okay. So the question was the homes that flooded in the Bear Creek sub subdivision. And can you understand the context? I mean, that. There were homes there that flooded because of the bayous trying to get water into the reservoir, and there were homes that also flooded because the reservoir pool levels came up. So th those two phenomena contributed to the, the flooding along uh, the Bear Creek Village area. As, as far as projects are concerned, uh, those, those residents live up against the Attics and Barker reservoirs, which are owned and operated and maintained by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, we are a partner of the Corps so we can advocate on their behalf to get them additional resources to increase the resiliency of Attics and Barker Reservoirs, which is obviously what we're, we're doing that. We'd like to see the Corps to get more resources to increase the, the, the capacity and, and the ability for these reservoirs to, to accommodate you know, these significant rainfall that we, that we saw. So meanwhile, the residents are not getting any help, either from Harris County or the federal level? Uh, well, right now, I mean, I mean, we've had, uh, I mentioned 3,000 residents have contacted us about uh, their interest in the buyout. Uh, there have been a good number from the Bear Creek subdivision contact us to get, requesting to get considered for buyout as well. Uh, again, we're, we're wrapping those up into the, the overall request that we have, and as we find out what funding will become available for buyouts, those certainly will give in consideration, absolutely. Um, how many homes? Let, let, before we get to that, let me... The, the, the question was, so the people in Bear Creek are not getting any assistance. Uh, that's not really a fair statement. The people in Bear Creek are getting assistance from FEMA. They are <coughs> getting DSNAP assistance. They're getting the same assistance anybody else did that flooded. If your question is long term, uh, then, then the only assistance they would be looking at would be buyouts. And frankly, again, this is me speaking. Uh, we have homes that were built on what were considered to be the 500-year pool line in behind the dams. Uh, that turns out not really to be a very useful line. So personally, I, I think those should be bought out. But that's just me speaking. That 500-year line obviously means nothing because none of those people have lived there 500 years and they've been flooded several times. But they are getting the same assistance that anybody else is, is getting who's been flooded. Um, how many homes were flooded uh, flooded because of the reservoir release from the Attics and the Barker? What was the count of that? Well, Ru Russ is going to step up while he, he's doing his calculation. I will say uh, one thing, two things about the reservoir release. Uh, number one, the county's party to a lawsuit, so we have to be a little bit careful about what we say. Uh, but but beyond that, I will say what has been said publicly, and that is that the Army Corps of Engineers was facing a situation where water was beginning to go around the edge of the dam in what was called an uncontrolled release. So it was a question of do you allow that uncontrolled release to get even larger or do you have a controlled release where you know where the water is going to go? And I think that's the question. Uh, so that was a call that was made. If the uncontrolled release, uh, you would have had a, a lot more homes flood, and we didn't know where the, they didn't know where the water was going to go. Have you got a number of homes? So the question was the number of homes that flooded downstream along Buffalo Bayou from the releases. Uh, we're, we're working with the city uh, on that information. Uh, we don't, do know it's probably several thousand. But at this point, you know, there were homes that were already flooding just from what Mother Nature put in the Buffalo Bayou watershed before the Corps even started having to make their releases. And so it's, it's a tough distinction to say how many homes flooded just from local rainfall versus uh, the core releases. And those are numbers we're still working on. For those homes, though, that didn't flood during Harvey and flooded after the reservoir release, but we're hearing from a lot of residents that they just didn't have any notice or any understanding of what the reservoir release meant. So is there a plan in place for an alert system in the future or better communication for the residents in those areas? They want to know why evacuation wasn't called for. Right, so the, from the alert perspective, we do have the alert 
gauge network that's accessible through our website that's got 155 gauges across the entire county, several of which are located along Buffalo Bayou. Uh, those gauges were active and were reporting during the entire Harvey event, with the exception of one downtown uh, near Milan. We actually lost that one due to the floodwaters. Uh, but there was uh, alerts given because our, our system was in place, and so residents who signed up to receive those alerts were receiving them. Uh, obviously, I think we can expand our footprint to better push out that information. Uh, social media is, 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 a, is a tool that we're looking at expanding our footprint into to get more, more announcements out that way. Uh, we were fairly regular, I thought, in putting up press releases regarding uh, the information as it was made known to us. I mean, the decisions to make the releases were made by the core. They would let us know when they were making those, and then we would tailor press releases and announcements as best we could once we knew what their intentions were. On the eastern side of the county, as many as 5,000 homes and businesses flooded in the Kingwood area. Many of those residents are highly critical of the San Jacinto River Authority and their actions. I guess my question is, do they have a beat? And should there be an investigation as called for by Councilman Dave Martin and others? The question is, uh, do the people in Kingwood have a beef with the San Jacinto River Authority and should there be an investigation? Uh, I'm not trying to be flip, but anybody whose home has been flooded uh, is going to have a beef. I mean, with somebody, and it may be Mother Nature, it may be a, a government entity. But in the case of Kingwood, uh, since I used to live there, that used to be my legislative district, um, I'm well aware of it. Forest Cove area flooded regularly over the years, but Kingwood itself never had. And there were people there who had never been flooded before, and they were flooded this time. Uh, I think the question of the San Jacinto River Authority, what went into their decision making, we weren't really that involved with it at all unlike the core where they were at least keeping us advised. So uh, I, I suspect that Representative Huberty and others uh, will have, I won't say investigations, but I venture to say the legislature will have uh, a significant number of hearings into the way river authorities work with emergency centers, for example, and should they be tied in more. And that's possibly the case. And then I will say, in the case of the San Jacinto River Authority, uh, I don't believe any of the members of that authority, I'm looking at my government relations person, I don't know if she knows the answer, I don't believe any of them are from Harris County. And so I, I think that's been one of the issues that people have brought up, that was it just a Montgomery County perspective that Harris County paid a price for? That will probably be part of Yes. Question for Russell, if I may. Um, as of today, you have explained that the buyout process takes at least a good six months, if not more. So as of today, does the county know whether it would be feasible to speed up that process, at least for certain homes, and therefore it could be reduced in how many months? Is, this, is that an option? Sure. The question was, you know, given the timeline that I previously reported upon about how it takes, how long it takes to buy out properties, if there's a way to expedite that. And I think the short answer is yes. And we're working with FEMA to ferret out an avenue to make that happen. I know, John, you had experience after the 1994 floods, and there was funding that was made available within 30 days or so of the flood itself happening. So we know it can be done. We're just looking at those avenues to see, you know, a lot has changed. Different policies have been in place in the last 20 years. But uh, our attitude is, is if it was done back then, it should be able to replicate it again today. And, and again, uh, the process that takes at least uh, half a year could be reduced to how many months, even though it wouldn't be a, just an estimate. Could it be like half of that, like three months, could it take? Or? I don't have a good indication on that yet, but I would like to have had the money already. I mean, here we're, we're coming up on you know, a month after the event, and uh, people are going to make decisions about what to do. And obviously, we'd like to get that buyout money now to help them make those decisions. But what does it really depend on for the county to have the funds to get this done? FEMA has to get the funding first, and then it goes through a state agency, and then they contact us, and we work out uh, the priorities of the homes that are eligible for buyouts. What's the formula? Let, let, let me add, let me add uh, one thing to that. Regardless of when the funds are available, uh, I would hope that the criteria would be in place, and we've talked about this, so that somebody knows if they're going to be bought out or not. Uh, even if 
even if the actual buyout doesn't occur for six months, as long as a person knows not to concern themselves about rebuilding because they're going to be bought out, then I, I think that's a much more uh, acceptable approach. What's the general formula for a buyout? In, I mean, do people historically, um, do they get a percentage of the equity in the So the question was, was how's the value established for purchasing that home? And uh, I think it's a very good program in the fact that once it's made the determination that these homes are eligible for buyout, an appraisal is ordered, and that appraisal is done on the property with pre-flood conditions in mind. <coughs> so in other words, even if the flood was damaged, regardless of how much during the event, the appraiser is told to evaluate the home and evaluate it value it at before flood conditions. In other words, so it would be valued as if it hadn't flooded. And that's the offer that's made to the resident as part of the buyout program. Are there any recovery efforts or future mitigation efforts that target low-income neighborhoods that will have a harder time recovering from an event like this? Are there any recovery or mitigation efforts that target low-income neighborhoods? That prioritize low-income neighborhoods. No, I, 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 unless I, Here's something different. Community uh, development that does have some. Turkels, they usually. But that's assistance programs. Yeah, but they actually fund certain areas, infrastructure. County engineers, can I answer? <laughs> I, I, and this is not a program I administer. Our community development group does, but typically they'll set aside amount of money that will go to the, the block grant money. They'll go to community development, and it will be for infrastructure repairs for uh, income qualifying neighborhoods. And we did that after Hurricane Ike also. So we did a storm sewer project that uh, prevented flooding and things of that nature, and it's based on the income of the neighborhood. And how about when it comes to buyouts? Do they prioritize multifamily structures or low-income neighborhoods? Uh, there's no priority that I'm aware of given there. Just the properties have to meet the criteria, which usually have to have a flood insurance policy, or at least that's one thing that helps them. Located within a 100-year flood plain, previous flooding uh, documents, those all help increase the odds of buyout for a property. And Judge, should the county prioritize efforts to help communities who have a harder time recovering from a hard time? Should the county prioritize those communities have a harder time recovering? Uh, I, I think recovery is one thing. Mitigation is something else. Sure. Uh, recovery, they are prioritized already. I mean, if, if you go to the disaster recovery centers, if you go to the DSNAP program, uh, those are, in, in large measure, income-based but in terms of mitigation no it's, it's a question of making the whole community safe and so where people live is is just more a question of hydrology than anything else that we need to look at um, one or two more Judge, to follow up just on, a gentleman asked here earlier I mean, it's, it's not a pleasant question but I mean, people are asking did we cheap out should we have built did other politicians, developers? The, the, the question is, decades ago? should we have done more and did we cheap out? Uh, those are always, you know, it's a question of, of priorities. Uh, could we have spent more and avoided some of the flooding? Sure. Uh, did the taxpayers want to have higher taxes to do that? No. So, I mean, th those are always the questions you can go back and look at. Uh, what concerns me now going forward is let's look at some of the, the projects that we know are going to help people, whether it's completing the four projects on the bayous, whether it's the third uh, reservoir, whether it's more money into the buyout program. You know, let's do those things and, and let's not cheap out at this point. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and, and take this for the lesson that it is uh, because 50 years from now, somebody will be standing here having a similar discussion and Somebody will ask, well, gee, should they have done something 40 or 50 years ago? And I would hope that uh, just as we can look back now and say, what if we didn't have addicts and Barker in the first place? Where would we be uh, in a world of hurt? So those decisions were made. The creation of the Harris County Flood Control District back in 1937. 1937. Those were all decisions that were made by, by policymakers that were good decisions. So, yeah, you can always say we shoulda, coulda, woulda done more, but at this point, we're trying to move forward. One or two more? I just wanted to get an update since Jeff is here and his family's been sure about it, the Lindner Fund, where that is. Okay. 
as I as I have put out multiple times, uh, that fund has been turned. In, I'm not taking the vacation. Uh, that fund's been turned into a relief fund. It's in a 501. And for those of you that follow me on Twitter, you can see who the money's going to. I'm passing it out. Um, and so I, I did some of that yesterday, and I'll continue to do that until there's more, no more money left. How much? How much? Yeah. The how much can you just tell us just in general how much and, and not to pretend we don't have Twitter and tell us where you <laughs> So the question was how much was in the fund after GoFundMe took their part. Uh, there was 19400 and something uh, dollars in there. There's been additional donations made since then. Um, and, you know, like yesterday I just went into a subdivision. It was Concord Bridge. And the first street I turned down, I got out, I walked up to the door, and I knocked, and I gave money away. And those people were unbelievably grateful. And it's not me. It's not me being – it's all of y'all that have given money. That's who they're grateful to. And so, um, you know, a lot of people ask when they give donations to big organizations, where does the money go? They don't see it physically given. Some of it goes into getting supplies, buying supplies, delivering water, you know, brooms, mops. A lot of the cleanup work, what we call the muck out work, is, is getting to be done. And so now the struggle for a lot of people who have flooded is how do I get my house back in order? You know, I'm spending my savings. I'm blowing through money. I'm, I'm having to stay at a hotel. And I, I'm still waiting on somebody to come into my house and start putting it back together. And so that's where a lot of people are right now. They're in that, that weird period between getting back into their house and being out of their house. And so that's why the need, you know, there's this big push initially to get in there and help people and get this stuff out, get the carpet, get the sheetrock out. But there's now the financial need to get people through this tough period until they can get back into their house. And just to give you an idea, because I have been through this, it takes about six months. That's what you're looking at. From the time you get everything out to the time you can move back in is about four to six months. And for a disaster the size of Harvey, it's probably going to take longer for some people. And that's just because there's only so much contractors can do here. We know they're working 12, 14-hour days to get people back into their homes. Um, but it's going to take that time, and that's why right now the real need is the financial need to get people to that point. Do you have any areas here, Sandy, that remain underwater, or is everyone <clears throat> at least to the point where they can start evaluating the house? Yeah, the question was do we have any areas that have water still? No. All the water is gone. Uh, there is still water in the pools of Attics and Barker. It is below all the homes, it is below Eldridge Parkway, and it is pretty much below Highway 6. Highway 6 is open. Uh, the center lanes are open. The outside lanes are still closed. The water is, is down off the highway, though. So there are no longer any areas in Harris County that are impacted by flooding. Judge, one, one, one question real quick. Last uh, two. In terms of scope, in the previous discussion, uh, when talking about uh, a buyback program, you had used the term $800 million as probably a, a bottom line figure. With as much as 3.3 million in terms of properties identified by FEMA, Does that numbers changed, or can you? No, the, the the question was, what's the magnitude of the buyout in terms of dollars? Uh, I don't think there's any question. If we could buy out everything that's out there, I think we're talking billions. But that's going to be a decision made at the congressional level. But I will say, uh, I don't want to just say we're going to wait whatever Congress does and that's all we're going to do. I think uh, in talking to uh, members of Commissioner's Court going forward, everybody understands whether we like it or not, we're, we're now going to be uh, flood control a lot more than we have been in the past. And we have to. And part of that is going to be buyouts. So even if the federal government doesn't give everything we need, then we're going to have to make those policy decisions of do we want to buy out even more. And it's an interesting dynamic because I don't want to get us off on a real lengthy discussion about taxes, but since county government only relies on property tax, buyouts, not only do you spend money, but then you also take that property off the rolls 
for future property tax, which is fine. I'm not saying it shouldn't be that way. But it lets me say one more time, for an urban county like ours, we need to find some other way of, of having revenue come to the county. And Commissioner Raddick has publicly talked about the billions of dollars that the state of Texas gets from sales tax in unincorporated Harris County. Uh, we're the only county in the country that has anything approaching the population we have in the unincorporated part of the county. We, we've just got to look at it and be, be treated differently. No, no question. One more? Yes. The, the question before I turn it over to either Russ or Jeff, uh, knowing that it's always a possibility that there would be releases from Attucks and Barker, had there been any studies done about what those, uh, what the impact of those uh, releases would be downstream? So the, the answer is yes. I mean, the Corps has what they call a water control manual, and they describe the various scenarios that they could potentially see as the reservoirs would fill and then what the resulting release rates would potentially have to be. So the answer is yes. Those are public. Uh, I'd have to check with the core, but I'm, I'm certain that they are. Well, one last question. In the face of what happened in Florida with Hurricane Irma, Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria, are federal resources tightening up in response to Hurricane Harvey? Are, because of Hurricane Irma and, and Maria in Puerto Rico, uh, are federal resources tightening up here? The answer is yes, but not noticeably. And I say yes only because there are people that have been working with us who aren't here now. They're over in Florida or Puerto Rico. But in terms of the ability to like man the disaster recovery centers and do the DSNAP and, and work with us, no, they, they're, they're all still here. Thank you all.